Hello, my name is Alan Brown. I am the Director of Development at QTC for the MKS Toolkit suite of applications. I've been doing this for just a little over 20 years now. I started out with uh, Data Focus as the, uh, one of the architects on the Nutcracker project and I uh, took over as the uh, Director of Development at MKS uh, back in about 2001. So uh, hopefully I have enough information to be able to share with you how and why uh, we introduced activation and that's the purpose of this briefing. So the first thing to understand is what kinds of licenses that we support. And that, that's kind of vital in knowing how you're going to end up activating. So part of the preparation work is to work with your sales manager to gather the information that you need to decide which type of license is going to be best suited for your application. So the, I would suggest that the first thing you do is take a look over the, our shrink wrap license agreement, which is at the URL at the top of the page there. Um, that will tell you a lot about how and why we license. The, it boils down to a lot of words that basically say that all of our licenses are node fixed and per machine. So uh, if you have the same physical person who is accessing the software on two different machines, it's two different licenses. So it's per user, per machine. And, and there are a lot of other words around that, which again, I suggest you read in the agreement, but um, that's the starting place. Now, we do provide um, a slight variation on node fixed, which I'll describe as a secure site license. It's, it's Windows NT domain fixed, Active Directory domain fixed. And you can lock an activation to one or more uh, physical machines that are a member of the same domain. Um, each machine will have a concurrent user count and we will provide you with a pre-activated license.dat file. In other words, there's, there is activation involved, but we don't uh, require any kind of round trip to a server. So you do it beforehand, you grab this license.dat and you use it during installation. The other two forms of license are node fixed, um, and um, they are named authenticated user and concurrent authenticated user. In other words, we don't license by person. We license by machine account, but we also don't permit multiple people to use the same physical account. So if you have one administrator on one machine, you could get by with a single named authenticated user. If you have many people who administer a machine, you might find that many authenticated users worked, or perhaps they don't all log into the machine at the same time, in which case you may find that a current, a concurrent authenticated user is the right solution to the problem. So each named user uh, must be specified before activation. So you know what machine you're going to install and you know which users you're going to have and you identify those before or right at installation, right at activation of the software. Concurrent, you don't necessarily know the names of all the, the users, or perhaps you do, but there are 20 of them and only two of them will ever be logged on at the same time. In which case, uh, a concurrent license might be a little bit more reasonable for your environment. And in that case, you just simply mark a count at the activation time. I want to decrement three or two from my license during activation. So uh, none of these decisions are permanent. If you have many licenses and you want to move uh, a named user from one machine to another, that's all perfectly legitimate and easy to do. So how are we going to prepare for this activation process? What are all the things that you need to know? Well, 
you need the software, obviously, and that's a 9.4, a 9.5, or a 9.6 uh, PTC MTS toolkit, or uh, an, uh, an X server version 8.7. These are all activated um, applications. And you, obtain, you need to obtain a product key. So we used to use a serial number and an access key. And to be honest, we had an awful lot of people who were um, pretty upset with the uh, how hard it was to to um, to key in the activation key, the the um, access key, and so um, we spent a bit of time looking around at what the industry does and felt that a product key was a little bit better, but it didn't describe as much as the access key, and so um, one of the reasons that we chose to activate uh, was to. You, you enter a very simple to enter product key, one that is very hard to, to mis-enter because uh, the characters that are in there are guaranteed to, to not look like other characters. And they're, they're a nice short string, it's not case sensitive. And once you've entered that, uh, you we send that product key off to our activation server. And what comes back is the access key, to be honest. That access key is still present and still used. It's just that you don't have to enter it anymore. It'll come from, from our online database. So the product key is the foundation of, of your installation. You don't enter a serial number anymore. You don't enter an access key. Uh, we'll get all that information at the activation point. So uh, you enter a product key. We'll mail that off, come back with a serial number, access key, and licenses and, and information like that. So um, when you upgrade from uh, a pre-9.4 version, you will receive a new letter with a product key that replaces your serial number and access key. Your serial number and access key didn't change, uh, but now you use your product key. And you will also be emailed um, a media download link from uh, MKS Toolkit Technical Support. If you're buying new, then in that case, you will get a PDF file from PTC License Management, and that will have the product key. It will also have the serial number and access key, but you don't need those anymore. Um, and a link to download uh, the media. And both of those are from um, Amazon S3. The next thing you have to decide is how many machines you're going to be installing on. If you're just a single user, obviously one machine, or maybe two machines or three machines. But if you are an administrator who's working across um, a large domain of machines, you might prefer to use um, a Windows installer admin install or perhaps a silent push um, using you know, maybe uh, Active Directory or one of the other network management packages. And, and these are all legitimate ways to install uh, and even activate. And so there's really no reason at all um, why you can't use these technologies. You don't actually physically have to visit every machine to activate it. It can be done as part of installation and part of a mass installation across multiple machines or even the deployment of uh, an upgrade or a patch. And uh, I, I, while I don't discuss patches in this, um, uh, in this presentation, um, there is, n there is uh, no activation change across a patch update. What you need to do is prepare each machine for activation. So while generally speaking there's not a lot to do, you do need, to, and I'll explain why on the next slide, you do need to enable all your network cards before you do an installation. And you do need to know whether you're using a virtual machine or physical machines because virtual machines really should be activated with um, a, a UUID style activation, which is new in 9.6 and, and Xserver 8.7. And, uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit about the, that form of activation later. And the other big thing, of course, is an activator account. And the question is how many activator accounts? Is it one per user or one per for your whole site? Uh, it's really up to you. Uh, we don't really mind how you, how you achieve this. Um, we do need one at least. And beyond that, if everyone were to share it, that's um, absolutely fine. If, um, if you want uh, 10 different activator accounts uh, for 10 different users, that's also fine. 
uh, that, that decision is really up to you. But you have to go to our website and, uh, and get an Activator account. And uh, once, you have, once you have entered all the information, which is really your name and your email address, and um, we will send you a link. And that link is just uh, um, a check to make sure that we found your right email address. And you click on a link, and that enables your account for activation. If you go halfway through that and try and use the Activator account, you'll get a nice little error message saying that you didn't click the link. Uh, because so your account is not enabled for activation. So how is it that activation works? What is exactly that we're doing? Um, it's it's a it's a simple enough concept. Um, we're going to collect uh, a little blob of data from your machine that uniquely identifies your machine. So in order to be node fixed, we need to identify that node in some way. A lot of people will use those uh, USB sticks or uh, some kind of centralized uh, activator, uh, perhaps like uh, FlexLM or, or its competitors. And, and we thought about those at, at some great length and how complicated they are and, uh, and you know, the distribution of the keys, the addition of the cost for the keys, the, the, the difficulty and setup of, of the software solution, what happens when you're disconnected from the network, how is all this going to work? So we spent a lot of time deciding you know, what's going to be the best and least intrusive solution to the problem. And we decided that you can identify a machine based on its SID, and it's the UUID of the system drive, so that's where Windows is installed, and the CPU string. That those three together uniquely identify a machine. And so we rolled out 9.4 and 9.5 with that solution in mind. And we discovered that, uh, that some of our customers are using virtual machines, and those virtual machines are often cloned. And while Microsoft says, you know, don't clone your virtual machines without running SysPrep, um, there still are a number of people out there who are doing that with some success. And so we ended up with uh, an activation on one machine, and then some other machine would come along and try and activate, and it was already activated. Or uh, a machine that was activated on one CPU and then moved to another and wouldn't properly deactivate. So with the with the way virtual machines work today, um, having them move from one physical central processing unit to another, from one server to another, uh, with cloning of drives and the cloning of Windows, we felt that we needed to add another mechanism to uniquely identify the node. And with that, we added the machine UUID. And so if you boot your machine, um, and, uh, in your BIOS is a UUID for every single machine. Each one has its own unique identifier. And each virtual machine also does. So we thought that physical machines were working fairly well with the SID, the SID and machine drive UUID and the uh, CPU string. And so uh, we really have thought of machine UUID as being specifically um, for virtual machines. But there's no real reason why that, that can't be used for any node identification. So if you prefer uh, machine UUID flavor of activation, you can uh, contact technical support and they will switch your serial number over to using machine UUID. And on the next activation, we'll start to use that. So th that's how we identify the node. And then we have either a user list or count of users, so 10 concurrent activated users. Or um, we have a user list. So for example, five um, specifically named uh, authenticated users in the Windows uh, either Active Directory or local machine domains. And you have to identify those before uh, activation, and we will gather the SIDs of those, of those um, users, the MAC addresses, all of the MAC addresses of the machine, the, the unique identifier for the machine or identifiers, and we'll send those to PTC. And we do that both online and offline. You can do it either way. Uh, we do understand that uh, there are environments 
that you can't bring things out of, and that's one of the reasons that we provided the um, uh, the secure site license, the domain uh, preactivated license. But for the majority of, of environments, online will work. If you have a technical lab, for example, that is not uh, online, you can copy the, the activation packet onto um, a flash drive or something and bring it to a machine that is and go online and activate it and bring back the activated packet. So what do we do with this packet? It doesn't matter whether it's online or offline. Uh, once it gets to the PCC activation server, it's treated exactly the same way. So uh, we're going to basically sign this packet and send it back. And there's just a couple of things we do. We keep track of which node it is. We keep track of how many licenses are in use on that node. And we keep track of the, of the activator username and password that was used. And, and once the packet is signed, we return that information back to, um, to the machine in the form, in really the same form as a license.dat that you would get from, um, from, from either one of the sources I mentioned earlier for a secure site license for a domain fixed license. And, and that license.dat file is stored on disk now. Uh, with 9.4 and 9.5, we stored it in the registry. And the problem was that there, there, were, um, there were software packets out there that would scan the registry um, and open up the, the registry uh, directories. And when that happened, um, they would mark the, um, our activation packet as having been modified. And um, we would throw that out as, um, as some kind of a, a change to the activation packet after activation. And so uh, we moved it to the file system. Um, it's probably a little less convenient in the file system, but um, it's not really a, a performance issue of any, of any sort. So we get this license.dat, um, which we're going to store on disk, and then uh, we're going to pull out that information I talked about earlier, which is the serial number and the access key. And uh, for example, if your license were time limited in some way, like a, an evaluation, um, we would also store that information out of the response packet. So um, the difference between an evaluation version and a live version is simply in the response activation packet as to whether it times out or not. So what do we do at runtime? Well, obviously we validate the license signature to make sure it came from us. Um, we validate the counts, so either are there any users left or are there more users or the same number of users uh, using the system already. Um, if, those, if that passes, we're going to check to make sure that this is the right node. So if you activate a machine and then clone it, for example, you should get a failure because you're trying to run this activation on a machine that um, it was never intended to be on. Um, and in fact, you will not be able to deactivate that at that point. So um, what needs to happen is a, a call to uh, technical support to take care of that situation. I recommend that you clone all your virtual machines before you activate. And there's absolutely no requirement that you activate during installation. You can do the installation into your virtual machine. Then you can clone your virtual machines to your heart's content and then activate each one um, after cloning. So. That's certainly the way I would recommend virtual machines be handled. Um, if you try and clone a virtual machine after it's activated, you are going to get into a world of hurt. So um, at, at this point, I, I, would, I would say that there is a companion, um, there's a companion um, presentation to this one, which is an actual demonstration of installation to show you how it goes from one end to the other. Uh, we had originally and I recorded this as a single, um, a single presentation, but it was really very long with all of this information and all of the demonstration together. So um, this is the latter half of, uh, you know, we presume at this point that you have already gone through the installation process and that you may encounter some, um, some things that you want to do post um, activation, post installation. So. Uh, let me talk a little bit about some of those things and how they work and why they work and, um, uh, and why you might want to do them. Um, 
you may, for example, decide that you have uh, a new employee. Let's say that a different person takes over a job and needs to use the software, and an, an old person who, did, who no longer uses it is no longer needed on the, on the license. So you don't have to uninstall and reinstall to, to do that. You can just go to the control panel, and you can make a change to the authenticated users. And, uh, and we'll show that during the demonstration, show you how that works. Um, you can obviously change the number of concurrent authenticated users too. So if you have uh, a concurrent authenticated user license and you want to, uh, to change it from two to three or three to one or whatever, that's all perfectly legitimate. If um, you have an evaluation version, for example, and you're ready to, to purchase and you get a new product key, which is the live version, um, you can just simply change the product key. Uh, there's a, a location in the control panel I put under an activation tab that will allow you to change the activation key. And when you change that activation key, you're required to, uh, obviously, to, um, to reactivate. So it will deactivate the old key and it will activate the new key. And it's a really simple process. Uh, you just enter your username and password after the product key and away you go. Now, there are... Um, there are instances where you cannot change your product key. So let's say you evaluated MKS Toolkit for developers, but you really wanted uh, MKS, MKS Toolkit for interoperability, which also has the X server. So when you bought the license, you bought MKS Toolkit for interoperability. In that case, the two products are not similar enough from an installation perspective for you to be able to just simply change the product key. So we ask you to uninstall and reinstall in that case. So uh, how do you deactivate? How do you re restore or return licenses to the pool? You simply uninstall. Or, or as I said, if you change the product key, that is another, another place where we will deactivate under the hood. And, and then there is the, the concept of product upgrades. And there obviously are um, patches and there are, um, there are full revisions. So going from, um, for example, MKS Toolkit 9.4 to 9.4 patch 1 is a very simple, uh, a simple process. You simply ask, um, ask for a, um, a download link for the patch and away you go and there's no real change to your license. However, when you go from 9.4 to 9.5 or 9.5 to 9.6, there's a full product upgrade involved. And so let's say you had two serial numbers and you call into technical support and you ask for one of them to be upgraded. Um, in, in that case, we, you know, we, will, we will mark that as having the new version, send you the new download link, you download it, and uh, you, uh, during the installation, we deactivate the old product and activate the new product. And then let's say that you took that same download and you applied it to another serial number. At that point, we would install the software. We would remove the old software, which is part of that upgrade process. Um, and then, and during the removal of the old one, we would deactivate. And then we would go to activate the new one and you would get a failure because that particular serial number had not yet been upgraded to the later version. So you'd have to contact Technical Support to have them uh, upgrade that one for you as well, and then you could finish the activation process. So generally speaking, um, if it's not one of these simple things that you need to do, and in, for example, if you clone a virtual machine and find that it no longer works, excuse me, clone an activated virtual machine and find out it no longer works, you're going to need um, some help from uh, the technical support folks. And they're available at the addresses I'm showing you here, either by email, by web, by phone number, by fax. And I would point out that all activation failures are monitored. Um, so we know when there's been a problem and sometimes we can help before you call in and sometimes we can't. Um, so sometimes we, we, we will contact you proactively uh, and sometimes we won't. So, um, we, but we do know about all of the failures. What we don't know about, for example, is, is that uh, you've had a failure to run uh, software in an activated environment because we do not call home on every single run of the software. 
the only call home that exists is in that activation process. And during that call home process, we show you all the information that we're going to send um, to PTC so that you have an opportunity to review it. And we have an option to show you where what our privacy license looks like and what we're going to do with this information. So, um, but we do not call home on every single failure. So when you get a failure, um, we don't know about that. We only know that you fail to activate or deactivate or, or change. Um, so what are those most common activation problems? Well, let's be honest. Um, username and passwords are the number one most important problem. They, they come up 10, 20 times a day. Um, and and what, what usually is the case is that someone has forgotten their password. And there's a link on the uh, right, right on the page to tell you how to go and change your password. And it's a simple enough process. You log in, uh, you, log, you go, to the, go to the page, and you specify what your email address is. We'll send you a link. And then you click on the link, and we'll allow you to change the password. Uh, it's all very, very self-help, uh, very easy to do. And, and by the way, when you've, you can use that same username and password to view all of the activations that you've completed successfully. So uh, you can also log on and see your uh, machine list and uh, how many licenses they're using. So if, for example, you thought that one had been deactivated but wasn't and still shows up in the list, um, and then you're getting a license exhaustion, um, then you could certainly uh, contact technical support to ask them to... Um, recycle it for you since it, uh, the machine, for example, died without you having an opportunity to do it. Or I guess it happens a fair amount that's, that machines are on lease and they are simply returned to, um, uh, to the leaser without going through an, an uninstalled process. So if, if those are the case, you can contact technical support and we will, um, we will deactivate those machines for you. So the other two big ones that we see are node already activated and node already deactivated. And the node already activated is usually a cloned virtual machine. Um, and um, the node already deactivated is usually this bug that we recently fixed um, that was associated with using a bad password on a change request. So uh, we would deactivate um, we would deactivate the old on our end, but your end would still show up as activated. So um, when you when you went to do any further thing, we would say it's already deactivated, and really you have to contact technical support to get that worked out. So uh, technical support is your friend; they're there to help. Um, they do know about um, the problems as they occur. They're getting an email and um, they are well versed in all of these issues and how to help. So I do hope that um, this presentation has been useful. As I said before, there is a companion presentation that's purpose is uh, to just give you a quick demo of, of how all this stuff works so you can see it in action. Um, and uh, obviously uh, the technical support folks are there to answer your questions. And uh, if you had one for me, for example, um, you're welcome to fire that through technical support. They're always willing to fire a note to me. Um, thank you very much.